the uh, physical uh, physical money immediate almost immediately as compared to uh, you, I mean you can get digital money immediately as compared to physical money where you have to go to a near nearby ATM to actually withdraw your money and if there's and if that ATM happens to have no money you have to like go around driving around to find an ATM that actually has this physical money right as compared to um, our narrative where physical money you can get it almost immediately and it's just by a click of your phone right and then um, Oh. Okay, and then um, thirdly, right? So um, this this enables smoother transactions in forms where forex exchange, right? For example, the exchange of currency. You do not need to depend solely oh, on uh, foreign currency, a uh, physical foreign currency, where you can actually just uh, go to a foreign country and have that foreign currency with you in the form of an app, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, in Singapore, there is a large number of paranoid old people who like to keep their money, stack of money, in biscuit things because we don't trust this technology. What are you going to do in order to change that mindset? Um, uh, okay, um, okay, so um, these are like, um, the okay, I'm just going to move on to my second argument about small businesses, right? So it would help more small businesses, for example, hawker stalls, whereby uh, they do not, they wouldn't problems with changing uh, cash into smaller forms of cash, right? Because uh, when they have physical currency, the, they most probably are likely to make more mistakes in when they are giving cash. Yeah. Like they would like, and then like that mistake will accumulate over time and then it would actually make them lose out um, uh, in terms of, um, in terms of um, uh, physical, uh, physical, like, yeah. So uh, going back to your POI, right? Um, I mean, like, there are so many old people uh, out there that have already modernized the age of technology, right? And sooner or later, banks are not going to actually have cash anymore. So, like, this cash will be wor worthless over time. So, they would have to actually change to physical currency. So, it's the answer to the Thank you, Prime Minister. Following on leader of opposition. Thank you. Falsely creates state champions, which stifles the free market. 
especially against small and medium enterprises that tend to be more innovative and competitive and have chances of bringing even more productivity and unique um, inventions to the market. No, thank you. Secondly, like China, in an effort to promote its own credit card services, services like Union Pay, we can see that it unilaterally made WeChat the monopoly, right? The problem with that is that even beggars use WeChat now to get their money. This led to the government having a complete access to all the information of the every single citizen in China, almost one billion people. Regardless of whether, um, like additionally, every single retailer has to work with WeChat Pay. It's unfair that if I want to start a retail business, I have to give part of my profits and the, work, the money I worked so hard to own, no thank you, to, to this WeChat. It's, it's also a barrier to entry for any other service providers who cannot compete with WeChat because the government has already subsidized it. There's a monopoly and this is so detrimental to the market in general. We can see that the government intervention has pr proved to be so disadvantageous. The Chinese government can use this information to conduct surveillance and spying on the population through the use of backdoor technology and for other from the tracking that's happening and they could sell information and lead to even more corruption in the market. Furthermore, the government profiles you based on your consumption patterns and it could cause you to lose jobs because if you purchase goods and they categorize you on this social credit bank rating system, which affects your ability to get loans and licenses and jobs and everything. It's a complete lack of agency and autonomy. Yes? So like a lot of governments work with private corporations in order for their efforts for digitalization to work. In your world, would you support both then? The governments work with, the, with these private corporations, but we can see that in so many instances, it's proved to be so detrimental and disadvantageous that it's not necessary for them to work with these groups. We can see that organic change is already being promoted. So many, we can, if we walk outside, we can see grab pay terminals, we can see, we can see different measures like Apple Pay, all this is already readily available to us. Moving on, the government, uh, there's a complete lack of privacy and autonomy with the government's introduction of these payment methods. Even if we look beyond China, to allow any company to have a monopoly on data, which allows them to discriminate against people in dangerous ways. Thirdly, why is this counterproductive? Despite the fact that the Singapore government has spent lots of money and millions and millions of dollars promoting cashless payments in our society, it's, Singapore still falls behind many African countries like Kenya I mentioned. It, like, there's a waste of state resources and funding. Governments are, um, are notoriously bad at, 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 bad at allocating resources and capital for these, these purposes and they are unable to consider the actual harms of what they are imposing upon their people. We, we have to agree that governments have failed in so many instances to give these people the autonomy and rights to decide which company, based on their own meritocracy and their own innovative um, product, like to, for them to enjoy the profits that they've made, rather than the government accelerating this process. So we can see that just because these, um, these Terminals like grab pay terminals and Visa and MasterCard terminals are everywhere. It doesn't mean that people are going to use them. In fact, we saw that grab pay realized and WeChat realized that we don't need to have these physical terminals and that they could just put stickers and QR codes on the back of shops and that way that could, they could scan their payments. We see that government supporting this meant that they, like they failed at allocating the, the resources inadequately because they spent so much money on these terminals which could have been easily just replaced by a sticker. So for, for, for example, um, just because like Singapore's cashless pay terminals, like Grab and WeChat, could, you could just print it. And in the Indian government told people that they wanted to go cashless. They directed the population to deposit their money into third party bank to deposit their, like, their uh, money. But the issue with it is that like obviously, India is a developing country. People did not have access to banking terminals, and the people who weren't able to deposit their money, they lost their money because it was rendered useless by the government. The government has failed in so many instances to adequately provide these sort of resources, and that's why, as opposition, we 
strongly believe that the government should not accelerate this process and not fully, not fully invest themselves in supporting cashless payments. And this organic growth is already happening. Thank you. Thank you, Leader Fox. Trisha, all in the Prime Minister. Thank you.
the sea for us to become high, uh, the, uh, inflation. We think having the data of knowing the spending of the people can uh, can be an adjusting measure for the wage gap or, or even to, to calculate the GDP so much more efficiently, right? We can think, give you the effectiveness of digital money, but it's so much better right. than the micro and macro aspect after this bill, right? So MasterCard and Visa have been proponents of cashless payments for the past 30, 40 years. Your claim is that they are worse than the government. Can you please tell me what have they done wrong? No, my claim is that we governments can ask this pro uh, this corporations to actually in uh, pro uh, you know to actually propose to these people because in our world we can do both efforts by government includes efforts of government approaching these corporations. But even if you want this just government, we're fine with that because it doesn't matter if your credit card came from a government or came from a from a from a bank. At the end of the day, uh, all these banks and financial institutions are linked to the government and requires a, a form of supervision and accountability in the reserve banks for them to actually accumulate these forms of money. There is no independent, there is no financial institution that's free from all form, form of laws and accountability because those things already exist within the government structure. We think in our world, uh, we think uh, in our efforts, uh, right? But let's just let's just go back to the debate, right? What actually they what efforts of the government? What they should encourage people to use digital forms rather than physical. Forms, right? What did we told you? We told you that first, the world is digital, digitalizing, right? We all have a smartphone on our, on our table where we're highly dependent on it. We think that when, the, when, when money, which is a medium of transaction, a very, a very important commodity, is lagging in the, the form of uh, progression and modernization, we think it causes a lot of inconvenience. We think it gives room for a lot of human errors. We think that even the example that you gave, like, how about all this? old people who are not comfortable with technology. We think when government puts in effort, that also means government puts in effort to create an awareness, to give them an education on the importance of digital money, to teach them that keeping your money under your mattress is not safe and give you to higher forms of security risk. Just, and they are, and it's more, and it's, and success story of how they are able to change is like when, when Malaysia found out that the most old, old people are keeping their stash of cash under uh, to go to Hajj, that's when they established uh, the Kampong Haji for, them, for people to actually, uh, so people can trust these financial institutions. We think that the, that the transformation of digitalization reduces the transaction costs that significantly helps their consumers. In the sense that it creates them a lot less time and a lot of effectiveness uh, and, the, and the amount is more accurate. Do note that actually there's, uh, there's actually worth of hundreds and thousands of loss of money simply because of, uh, because of loss of Spare change here and there, which we think, uh, which we think, just if we have to, given the opportunity to uh, create the effectiveness, we will, uh, we will uh, fight for it. So I understand that the cashless transaction. So he, uh, this is the question that he asked, right? How do you grow the economy in this method? We'll give you one example that's relatable to all of us, right? So the app of like Grab Pays for credits and also. So when you pay, when you constantly pay using Grab after you transfer your money, you will accumulate these points. Although these points are not valuable in any form except in Grab. From that, you can actually access other food or you can have some free grab payment. What does this do? Two things. First, it encourages you to spend. Oh, I have 1,000 points, you know, and now I can, I can afford to you know, go to NUS Yale, you know, from wherever I was saying. And or like, or second, it, it, uh, or it, even like in, from the 20 ringgit that you invested, you actually accumulated a, another trip worth uh, five, 5 ringgit or 10 ringgit. We think that encourages consumers to spend. Consumer spending increases transactions. Transactions increases the trading of goods and services and productivity, and therefore that's what, that is a root cause of the micro spend that actually leads to the growth of the economy and more, more people are trying, uh, transferring money to do so. We think there's a kind of benefits you, um, that, that tax transactions have. We think these benefits will, uh, will, be, will continue to evolve as governments put in more and more efforts to encourage people to spend. Hi, uh, so the econ stopped. I am making a report to X to like get Econ back. Yes, so I apologize yes. for the I apologize for the stuffiness that you may feel for like the next few minutes. Mm -hmm. So sorry about that. Okay. Okay. So thank you, Justin. What? 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 Calling on. I didn't actually notice at all. Yeah. Like, this is just nice. Oh, we see the Econ stop. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So like, just send it something to get it back in the Econ. Oh, okay. Yeah. Other one, the Jedi and the Jedi Master. So, I think that the metric for this debate, that side government has tried to like semi squirrel, semi run away from, is about whether or not the acceleration towards a cashless society, specifically by the government, is a moral or a good action network. What we think is that we agree that governments can make efforts to obtain good things for its citizens. We believe that if an outcome is good in and of itself, the government should take steps to pursue that. 
But what this debate is about is just because the outcome of an action is good, it doesn't necessarily mean that the pursuit of that outcome is a good thing. And what we are debating about today is whether or not the pursuit of a cashless society by the government in terms of more harm or more good. So, and like, just before I move on to my substantives, because recognize that we agree with all of the things that they say about why a cashless society is good. We think that more spending is good. We think that the ability for people to like, manage their things is good. We think the ability for governments to use this statistic data to like help improve economic policy is good. But their burden, their specific burden in this debate, is why the government should take steps to accelerate reaching that end point when we have both on both sides of the house conceded that that outcome is likely to occur anyway. They need to tell us why that marginal increase in the difference of obtaining a cashless society in a few years sooner makes it so much more valuable than what were the harms that we're saying. And the example about how like private companies like Grab create points that increase spending is actually an example for our side because the government hasn't actually incentivized Grab to like, you know, create a point system. I'm going to tell you four reasons why people are unlikely to respond to government efforts, and I'm going to tell you three reasons why private companies are likely to do it better. So firstly, do we think that people feel as if the government needs to do these things? Because recognize what happens when citizens view that governments put in, if, put in like dumb policies that are unnecessary, is that citizens obviously won't buy into those policies, right? So when, for example, you see that the government puts out like a net flash pay thing in your canteen, and you think, it's kind of dumb that the government's spending tax money on this thing. I don't think I should support it. I think I'm just going to spend my money anyway. We think that people don't buy into it then. But even if we concede that, gov that, like, gov that like, people are maybe likely to buy into it, here's one reason why we think that they are unlikely to like it, right? Because recognize that my first speaker, the nuance that my first speaker presented that went completely unresponded to is yes, we agree governments will partner up with private companies. But oftentimes this leads to two things, right? Firstly, it leads to governments choosing a state, state champion. What does this mean? This means that obviously if you want to partner with a with a company, you have to partner with a company, a singular company, someone who you sell the contract down to. And oftentimes the governments, that do, the way that they do this is they sell it to the lowest bidder. What does this result in? Real world context here. Two examples, firstly in developed countries, second in developing countries. We think that this leads to unpopular banks in developed countries actually obtaining these contracts. Because these banks that don't provide as many services as the most popular banks in these countries can offer the best rates to this government because they don't have to spend excess money on different services to provide their people. This results in banks like Quebec National in Canada being the actual partner for the digital cashless transaction. This means that people need to create new bank accounts which they don't actually like and aren't actually going to do to opt into these things. We think that the comparative is that in a free market, these people who already have established market share are going to create their own cashless, cashless systems that people are going to be more likely to buy into. Secondly, in developing countries like Ghana, right, where it partners with overseas Chinese banks which can give the governments the best returns on these transactions, mean that they don't actually have the ability to give these bids and contracts to a local company. We think that this directs transactions and like this creates a reverse multiplier effect where money leaves your country instead of goes into your country, which definitely detracts from the actual benefits that you can obtain. Yeah. Second, uh, sure. So like, if societies are already moving towards the direction of digitalization, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. then would, why wouldn't there be a buy-in again? Uh, there won't be a buy-in because the banks that the government chooses to support aren't popular banks that people will use. There won't be a buy-in because they don't trust overseas Chinese banks. And there's not going to be buy-in because people don't believe in supporting stupid government policies. Two more reasons, right? Firstly, if you follow government's model where money is eventually phased out, what this means is that people who don't deposit their bank, their money into their banks, that money becomes worthless. This is precisely what happens in India. This is an idiotic policy because what this results in is dozens of like essentially millions of people, because we're talking about India here, yeah, have lost their money because recognize that the way that poor people for ages on end have decided to keep their money is precisely as Alfred said, in stacks of money at their home as comparative to what rich people do, which is they buy assets. What this means is that when you follow government's model of eventually phasing out cash money, this cash money that people have lying around in their house eventually becomes worthless, further pop impoverishing these individuals in these places. Now, what do we think that this causes a secondary problem? Because this is in co this is in direct contention with what they say that like people make mistakes with actual cash money. We think that what's far worse to happen is corruption. And I'm going to tell you a unique point that Ashish Kumar taught me, which is that corruption doesn't happen in the bureaucratic government. Corruption happens on a local level when your civil servants, who are tasked by the government to help individuals create bank accounts, use this as a front to do like corrupt transactions and money launder. What this means is that your government economy suffers worse because of all this influx of fake cash into this digital system. Last reason why we think people are unlikely to buy into 
or these government decisions, which is sort of an extension, but also sort of an argument as to why people don't want to support student policies, right? Because pretty much what is a responsible decision for a government to do, and what is something that the people will believe in supporting. We think it isn't throwing away money in ineffective policies, like buying terminals for every single hawker centre. We don't think that it's trying to throw out grant money to every single company in the world to try and like, it, to try and get them to do cashless payment because of two reasons, right? For, and this is why these policies are likely to always be effective. Two reasons. These governments oftentimes fall prey to two things. Firstly, cronyism. Secondly, apathy. In terms of cronyism, what happens is that a big finance minister is like, oh, I heard that cashless payment is good. I'm going to throw a bill for you to approve cashless payment. Everyone is going to follow suit with me. Secondly, apathy. We think that oftentimes governments in developing nations where like, I imagine that cashless societies will have the most benefit because that's what they've tried to predicate their case on. Oftentimes what results is these governments are detached from the individuals on the ground. They don't truly know what these people mean. Now, here's the comparative about why we think private markets are far better. Firstly, we think that free markets mean that companies who actually create good cashless systems are more likely to succeed. Actually create systems that the people want. They're actually closer to the individuals and they, have and they have tons and tons of people who are concerned with what is the actual best policy because these are companies who care about their bottom line. Secondly, we think that market regulations mean that companies can be regulated and even if they can't, Imagine if on the next day the newspaper reads that Mastercard had a fraud scandal in this country somewhere in the world. Their shareholder shares will plummet to the floor. We think there's disincentive for these individuals to actually commit crimes in these areas. And lastly, we think that even if scandals occur in these areas, we think that the ability for like the government to actually become more corrupt is more powerful. Because at least the government can regulate people, but no one can regulate the government. Because PAP is the only government in the world where government can check government. <laughs> Thank you to the leader of opposition. Strong government. Thank you. I mean, besides humor, there were a lot of contradictions and points that doesn't make sense. I'm going to look at a few things in my speech. Number one, what does effort even look like? Number two, let's talk about burden specifically, which is particularly important. Last time we talked about things like, for example, how governments are more likely going to react, whether or not corporations are better on the comparative, and whether or not at the end of the day we actually necessarily get by you. So first, let's talk about efforts, right? Of things that gov efforts necessarily means we are going to have one particular singular government sanctioned um, like corporation, and hence it means all of the benefit, all of the harms of things that we offer, the infiltration of data and everything happens. They assume the debate happens in China. Look, if you take the alternative to suggest that if they don't want this in China, the comparative is Chinese government still takes over a people's uh, data, still controls their people, and on the comparative, there's no comparative there. Number two, if they say, ah, but corporations are good. Mind you, uh, the debate they talk about in China is run by a corporation called Tencent. WeChat is called from Tencent. Alipay is from Jack Ma. Like, all of the arguments about why corporations are good are literally the arguments they suggest why China is necessarily bad. On that competitive, they can't make the debate in this side of the house about China. Number two, then they say, ah, uh, but like, when it comes to efforts, you can't necessarily have one. Look, I feel like it's okay for Gov to suggest that there'll be a variety of versions of efforts, and I feel like that's necessary to understand. What does it look like? So some states oftentimes open and make markets easier for other versions of corporations to enter into the digital market. So for example, in Malaysia, we literally have 14 different types of like digital currencies. On that comparative, government efforts also means the efforts of allowing other corporations to enter. That's why the comparative they have to suggest is decentralization of corporations or less efforts for the movement towards corporation. They never give you any reasons as to why government necessarily cannot work together with states. On that comparative alone, literally all of the arguments fall onto gov from what opposition might suggest. But even if I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt, yeah, yeah later. Let's talk about the things in which they talked about. Number one, they say, guys, there will not be any buy-in because people don't trust government. But like, no comparative as to why corporations are more likely going to trust governments if corporations are going to govern the trust of individuals. The only analysis they give is because some corporations are successful. But no arguments as to why our versions of digital currencies are not as successful. Because if the metric of buy-in is success, we say governments are more successful, more likely. How? Number one, for the very fact that you are able to vote in things that we got from government into place means that the ability for you to fear less of governments and fear less of individuals that you can't necessarily control are less in outside the house. So the metric you must decide when it comes to buy in which corporation or which entity do people fear less. Oftentimes the ability for you to vote means you fear less.
best of governments as opposed to corporations that you can't necessarily vote in. It means that less buy-in happens in this other house only through the efforts of states where you're able to have societies move forward the direction of actually accepting these kind of um, digital currency. And this directly engages with all of the arguments and all the POI that they, they talk about. Like, how about all these uncles who don't necessarily want that? Uncles trust governments more because uncles can vote in governments. That is a better world at the end of the day. Number two, they say, guys, but like, they are unpopular. Okay. Second, they say, governments are more likely going to, um, governments are more likely going to give in these contracts to the unpopular banks that give you the least amount of money to pay to these banks. But then the second argument then comes, ah, but corporations are going to give for foreign banks that have more popularity and more services. So the first is, I'm unsure. Do governments give it to bad banks or do they give it to good banks in Oxford? But first, but second, let's look at both cases scenario. Right? Number one, no thank you. I feel like it's, no thank you. There's a disincentive to actually give to unpopular banks and bad services in this other house. Why is that necessarily true? The first is because when governments give grants or give contracts, the legitimacy of that government is attached to the kinds of contract that they give. It means that if the kinds of banks that you say are bad and are going to give bad services, on a comparative, it's less likely these governments are going to give these contracts to these bad, bad, bad banks because it means necessarily that the legitimacy of that government is hackled by that decision. So it means that on a balance of probability, they're going to give it to the good banks, hence it means that it's untrue, you're going to get bad services. Number two, ah, but then they say foreign bank. Okay, second, when it comes to foreign banks with useless money, right, the problem with that is that firstly, zero compact. Zero structural reasonings as to why necessarily governments even have the incentive to give it to the foreign banks. But number two, let's assume the worst case scenario. If foreign banks equals to more capacity of services and better services, I don't necessarily think that trade-off is a bad one because it means at the end of the day, your consumers are still a bit off. And hence it means on this comparison, you must consider the metric of who necessarily benefits groups even more. And hence if it means that if foreign banks are beneficial for consumers, if it means that banks have more on a probability incentive to give to better banks, it means your consumers at the end of the day are better off. On that, we win the issue show. Uh, what if your old uncle who's unlikely to buy into the government's paradigm voted for opposition? Yeah. <laughs> so like, number one, generational gaps means that even if the old uncle still exists, like generations take over. Number two, even if we are able to tell you that some groups are going to be traded off, this side of the house says that when these groups of people collect and store money in their own homes, and that is bad because it renders it useless, then Fox says, but we're okay with the transaction of that, it still means that they're going to be symmetrically the same amount of groups that are going to save money in this other house within their pillows. So this issue at best is symmetrical at the end of the day. Number three, let's talk about the issue of corruption. They say, ah, guys, but there's no corruption in this other house. Number one, corruption happens when you have no ability for you to assert yourself. What does it mean? It means things like, for example, the lack of accountability structure. They never tell you in a world where you only allow free market where it's only run by corporations, that structure of accountability exists. That's number one. But second then, DFO says, ah, but you have regulations that can regulate, right? Regulation by nature is a state intervention on two things that exist. That means that if they were to say, you want regulation, that is part of efforts to ensure that individuals have better services in outside of the house. Hence, it means you can't necessarily go with that. Last, they say, guys, but companies have good market systems in this side of the house and those are the ones who are going to succeed. Number one, I agree. But then, they never give you any reasons as to why this cannot work hand in hand with states. We told you things, for example, structures, to what this existing with states more likely going to get more comfortable structures that individuals are going to buy in. Hence, it means the direction to that is necessarily good. Last, let's talk about support. When it comes to support, what you necessarily need to consider is whether or not something is worth supporting in the future. If we are able to tell you things, for example, human error, that oftentimes the marginal difference that people make that accumulates into large amounts of losses, especially for SMEs and stuff like that, requires an immediate push that requires an acceleration. So this directly takes on the burden of says, but why acceleration? Because right now, if you don't accelerate, literally people don't buy in, people are harmed because of the loss of money, and at the end of the day, people don't necessarily understand why it's necessarily good. For all of those reasons, Prabhu Thank you, Governor Now calling on opposition. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Oh, 
apologize in advance because this might be an active devaluation. Uh, but since these are my friends from Malaysia, you know what, let's have some fun. <laughs> I find it quite funny that Malaysia, a team from Malaysia, having gone through a recent YMDB scandal, is telling me that governments are far more accountable than trust them for money so they can do what they want. And what they want is for the government to cooperate with private enterprises because obviously governments are not corrupt. The benefits are obvious. The PM spent seven minutes talking about it without really justifying what the government needs to do anything. The old, there's already an organic movement towards it precisely because of PM's speech. Yes, cash, a cashless payment system is clearly superior. That's why even in the Horn of Africa, the least developed areas in the world today, in Kenya, private banks tied up with local telcos to set up the cashless mobile banking system called M-Pesa which is the most widely and commonly used internet, uh, mobile, sorry, yeah, no internet, yeah, mobile, mobile banking system in that area, right? So in all of the countries like Ethiopia, Nigeria, and Kenya, they had 15% GDP growth over the past decade, partly because of this M-Pesa banking system, right? All of this with not a single inch of government intervention because governments over there are, frankly speaking, quite incompetent. In countries in the poorest part of the world, had the highest adoption rate for this cashless system, I would suggest that what we should do is to simply allow free market enterprise to flourish, right? Because yes, obviously private profit making companies have a corporate interest to make money, but they don't do so by cheating you. Because if they cheat you, you can turn to another company. They do so by innovating and providing the best possible service. Because what Gav is saying is that these companies are never accountable, which is strange because we live in a capitalist society. The logical conclusion of what they're suggesting is that the government should nationalize everything. And to be honest, once again, look at all the things that the Malaysian government has nationalized when it comes to public utilities, when it comes to everything that nationalized and pretty much topped up. Because it's subject to politicians' whims and fancies, and even the, even the government can change from time to time, like again, not every country in Singapore where people itself check oneself. <laughs> Next, let's talk about. Um, what is this? Bit? Ah, yeah, yeah. So I think like. Government was very naive, right? To claim that a government provided credit card or WeChat is no different from one provided by companies. Because like we need to realize, like if you read the economies over the past two years, which I have from time to time, right? Private corporations are subject to international regulations, right? So there are EU data protection laws, there's PDPA. So for example, right, if you sign up for my company's debate program, we must protect the data that you give us because otherwise the Singapore government will come after okay. us. Right? So there are many rules you have to follow and you don't a lot of terrible things happen. So for example, your reputation suffers. When Sony had a hacking and its information was leaked, share prices dropped 10%. Google is facing lawsuits all over the world worth billions of dollars. In many situations, this can be criminal action can be undertaken. I think in comparison, governments are a lot more dangerous because there's nothing stopping states from doing whatever they want from this data and monitoring its citizens. So we already told you, the problem with WeChat Pay, no thank you, is that as the monopoly, monopoly they can track every single financial transaction that's made across the market. Government, so I don't want to tell you, but government can monitor everything anyway. Not really. There's a difference between government having CCTV cameras planted everywhere, which by the way, it's quite late to check down one by one to see what's going on because you have billions of CCTVs. It's comparatively easy when you have a financial log of every single financial transaction to be able to automatically program what you purchase and then assign you a social credit rating system to spy on you and discriminate against you. So for example, in China, if you purchase religious texts, the government, the CCP government gives you as a threat to communism mm -hmm. and then marks down your social credit rating system to make sure that it's harder for you to get a visa under the Hukou system, for example, to go to Beijing to work because the Chinese government doesn't want religious people in Beijing because they might tr cause trouble for the central government. Similarly, when we had de demonetization in India and like all that corruption and money disappear, all those things happen, we say that that tainted the views of the local population with regards to what um, a cashless society truly means because now when governments heavily intervene in this system, citizens view these actions with 
with, with suspicion and therefore are actually less likely to adopt these things because they're worried about what the government might do to them. I think your policy is counterproductive. Before that, yes. Your best case scenario is China where Tencent is like literally WeChat and Alipay are both corporate entities that run independently. Yeah, yeah. Monopoly. WeChat A, even the beggars use. Alipay, nobody really uses. Right? I hope you've been to China, you know this. If you don't, I, I kind of hate. I know other things. Why is government intervention ineffective? Right, this basic economic knowledge. They say that government should support and work in tandem. We say governments very often make things worse. Because A, even when they work together. So for example, I think when Malaysia backs Grab and Grab Pay, I will argue that this has been to the detriment of the free market as well as other superior players. My best friend Ruben bitches to me non-stop about how Uber is so much superior because apparently you get rights faster and the customer service tends to be better but because you have market intervention which blocks out other more innovative players the market suffers as a result because markets are because governments are notoriously inefficient at allocating economic resources the second reason why it's problematic is that government intervention very often means throwing and wasting taxpayers' money. We gave you an example of Singapore where the government created ATM terminals assumption, with the assumption that accessibility equals adoption. The problem here is that what really happens is that politicians who are themselves not economic experts but are populists make crowd-pleasing statements and promises to promote this much like what side government has done, right? But they don't realise that just because the politicians say something doesn't mean that you snap your finger at something or works. You have a system of bureaucrats below you who go, wow, the Prime Minister say must promote cashless. Okay, let's roll out a lot of money and give everyone terminals. What happened? These terminals became what and funds because Faith and Grab and many other small and medium enterprises which are innovative realise you can just place a freaking QR code sticker instead of spending money to give them that stupid terminal which is worthless in the first place. Thirdly, we think small and medium enterprises suffer from the cashless society in whichever form under their side but it's worsened by government intervention because very often what this means is that all your small marmot store owners who use cashless have to give 2-3% to of their profit to the service provider of that cashless system and serving as a double tax to these individuals something they've never been able to justify we think people suffer, small businesses suffer for government with money, we oppose. Thank you, opposition with opposition reply. Thank you. Because recognize that while your government has the ability to 
say it checks itself, oftentimes it really doesn't, right? As opposed to this, oftentimes international companies with big names like Visa and MasterCard are held to account, are held to account by international bodies. So even though the EU Data Protection Act doesn't technically apply to Singapore, Visa and MasterCard's websites still need to comply with them, which means that even when we access those websites, our information needs to be stored in the same way because it's just easier for them, it's just more convenient for them, and it makes it so that they aren't subject to any lawsuits in the potential future, which makes it so that these companies are far more trustable. And people on the ground know that, right? People on the ground know that when there's an international conglomeration, yes, they want your money, but at the same time, there are other companies who also want your money, that if those people are more trustable, those people will flock to those companies. We think that this free market doesn't just apply to which company is the best, but it also applies to which company is the most trustable. So secondly, how do companies work in terms of loss of money? What did they try to tell us? They, taught, they tried to tell us that SMEs are likely to lose money. So firstly, if, like, I'm just gonna bite the bullet here and I'm just going to say something that everyone's too afraid to say, which is that like, look, if SME money lose money due to transactions, maybe they should lose money because they're stupid, right? Then, next, well, how does this make corruption worse on their side of the house? What did they tell us? They told us that corruption will happen on both sides of the house. We agree, corruption will happen, will continue to happen, and will always happen. What we're saying is that it makes it worse when you create mass state programs in which huge influxes of new bank accounts, new transactions, all happen at once, which allow governments to create basically fronts for money laundering, which allow governments to basically turn money that they've obtained from corruption from like black money into clean money. And lastly, how do governments actually work? Because they tried to like straw man my, straw man my point about how developed countries pick bad banks and how underdeveloped countries pick bad banks. We think that developed countries are likely to pick the lowest bidder, which is to say, not banks that don't provide services at all, or not banks that don't provide bad services, but merely unpopular banks that people usually don't opt into, which makes it inconvenient for them, which makes it so that they won't opt into these government services. And secondly, for underdeveloped countries, like just leasing out government contracts to overseas banks, even if on a like simple level that doesn't seem shady to you, the fact that the government is doing something counterproductive when it funnels money and funnels percentages of transactions away from this company causes these company causes these countries to be more impoverished. For those reasons, go aside opposition. Thank you, opposition. Play. Government yeah, yeah.
to this essay to the lay of accountability when it comes to the uh, bureaucracy of government in comparison to each other, in comparison to corporations in which is profit motive in which with, uh, one of the arguments we stated today was that they have the incentive to cater to the market that gives them the most profit there's no incentive for them to cater to every single person or the full outcomes that they wanted for that so much that's why they, I mean, we, need, we need to debate this argument where it actually clashes which is the middle ground and what's most logical what's most probable we need to understand that the, that the revolution that is extremely important and government efforts include include, include, uh, include all the people of all levels from the uncle to the mattress to the uh, high, high corporation and uh, financial institution. Because what? Because we told you it gives you better economic growth. We explain the process to you. I mean, just a simple example of like how the coins are accumulated. Those are the things that show you that government has to put in effort to help people <coughs> adjust to the revolution that's actually ongoing rather than the radical examples that and not really engaging with the fact of the reality that both government and corporations have good and bad. They have to be comprehensive if they want to be with the They have to be realistic. Thank you, Dr. Um, and after that, um, go back to the LTE and the...